Thank you, Matt. Thank you for your singing. That was great. If you would turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11. We are going to be in Hebrews 11 tonight. Hebrews 11 is uh, such a great section of Scripture because it fortifies our faith in a hostile world. You think about just the world we're in. Uh, It seems like the world is spiraling out of control in front of us. Uh, Just if you watch the news, obviously, if you watch people debate uh, what a woman is, simple definitions of manhood, of womanhood, uh, biblical manhood is under assault, biblical marriage is under assault, we have uh, no standard for, for morality. Just restraint in society seems to be uh, going away. Uh, increasing violence, theft, lawlessness, homosexuality is celebrated. And if you've watched any of the, the pushback from Roe v. Wade decision by the Supreme Court, you've seen just an unmasking of the evil of the human heart. People that would celebrate uh, abortion. People that would actually say that, that protecting children it is an offense to them. They would actually call a virtue slaughtering children in this country. So you see that the world around us, the evil around us, uh, spiraling out of control, uh, good being called evil, evil being called good. And you think about just, just 20 years from now, think about the, the children in this room. What is it going to look like for them to raise families in this society? What is it going to look like for them to try to raise children in a, in a society that's going downhill so fast. When we get to the book of Hebrews, it is such a helpful book for a, an uncertain future, for a future that might look like persecution, a future that might look like increased hostility toward the gospel. We actually get to see, especially in Hebrews 11, we get to see a historical faith on display, truths that would fortify us for a, an uncertain future. So we're going to see truths here, In Hebrews 11, specifically, we're going to look at a truth that is going to fortify us to withstand the days to come. And this truth tonight is the truth that God's faithfulness is not measured by circumstances. God's faithfulness is not measured by circumstances. To say it another way, we cannot equate outcomes with faithfulness. We can't say that God is faithful because this happened Because this circumstance happened, God was faithful, or God was not faithful because things didn't turn out this way. Think about how dangerous it is to try to to guess at what God is doing behind the scenes. We try to to come up with with plans and programs to try to say, we're going to dictate what faithfulness looks like. We're going to be results-based. You think about pragmatism in the church that would actually look look at measures of faithfulness based on results to say we had this many converts, this many people heard, this many confessions of faith. So that must mean that we're, we're preaching the truth because we had a result. Rather than the, the hard faithfulness of opening your Bible, preaching the word, and letting God do the work. Right, that takes faith to preach the same message, to endure hostility, to, to be ridiculed, and to say, no, this is the only way. This is, this is what we're going to cling to. Think about this, this same thinking could infiltrate our parenting. If you were a, a results-based parent, to say we're only going after results, we have to manipulate, we're going to do whatever we can, whatever new trend comes our way, we're going to add into our house to try to get these results. Because it's hard to, to sow seeds, it's hard to just preach the same truths to your kids, to discipline and instruct, and to not see immediate fruit. You might be tempted to think, okay, what do I have to do here to to get results? How do I get the outcome that I want? And think about in persecution, in trials, how dangerous it is to be results-driven. If you're looking at results, you're looking at situations. You think about just, just trials in your life. If you've been in trials that press you, where it feels like you're just, you're in the wave You can't see in front of you. You just have this tunnel vision. The situation that you're in is just so consuming. It's hard to to see light at the end of the tunnel. And in those moments, we're tempted to think that what I need most right now is relief. I need the situation to change. That's what I need. That's the temptation that we face. And we're going to see tonight what we need in those moments is not a, a change of circumstance. 
What we need is a, an enduring faith in a faithful God. We need hope in God's future promises. We need to continue to cling to his character and his word. So as we get to Hebrews, if you would actually turn to Hebrews 10, 32, turn back a page, we actually see this is a, written to a church facing persecution. Hebrews 10, 32, the author writes, but remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming shares with those so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. You see the, the temptation here for this church facing persecution. They're facing persecution from the world. They're, face, they're facing temptation from within. Even you see in this book that there's a, a subtle, easy believism that's infiltrating the church. An easy believism that says you don't have to fight so hard. You don't have to keep fighting sin. Do you really have to work so hard at this? Can't you just enjoy these benefits and kind of chill a little bit? Or can't you have this just peaceful, nice American Christian life? And the author of Hebrews, especially once we get to Hebrews 11, is going to tell us, no, that is not the Christian life. That has never been the life of faith. We actually see that, that faith throughout the Bible is a life of, of suffering and hardship for the, sake, for the sake of the Lord, doing hard things, making sacrifices, believing in what you can't see. As you turn to Hebrews 11.1, 1, the author gives us a, a simple definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. That's what faith is. It's looking at the things that you can't see, future promises of God, and bringing them to the present to make them visible so that what you don't see, God's promises, God's character, his goodness, becomes more real to you than what you can see. Trials, circumstances that are hard, situations that, that don't change. So faith, as John Owen says, faith is the title deed to glory. The title deed is how you take hold of future promises through faith. You think about things that are not seen, we can't see God's faithfulness. We can't see spiritual things. We can't see what happens after death. We don't see that. The only way we know what happens after death, the only way that we know that God holds together this universe is because he tells us. So what gives us conviction, what gives us clarity about those things is faith. It makes those things clear to us. So we're gonna see Hebrews 11 lays out these examples of faith saints in the Old Testament who exercised faith in future promises. As we get to Hebrews 11.32, we're going to be tonight, we're going to see that faith is not measured by what you can see. In the fight of faith, you will have victories and you will have great defeats. And through all of it, you must continue to hope in God's character, his faithfulness, his promises, in his word. So circumstances will change, trials will come, your health will fail you, and you must have faith in what you cannot see. So read with me, passage tonight, Hebrews 11, 32, we'll be reading through verse 38. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release, so that they might obtain a better resurrection." And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, 
They were tempted. They were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. The author starts out this section by saying, time would fail to tell of all of these additional stories. He's actually gone through to this point. He's gone through from creation, from Abel to the, the patriarchs, through Noah to Moses. He's gone through the whole first five books of the, of the Bible, the Torah, all of the great acts of faith. And now he gets to, to the rest. He says, time would fail to tell. I could tell, keep telling these stories. And what he's saying is that every act of faith is the same. Different circumstance, same faith. Trust in future promises, trusting in what you can't see, a future that is more sure than the present. He's he's basically saying, are you convinced yet? If not, let me give you more. I will give you the rest of the Old Testament. He's basically, now he's going from the, the judges to Samuel to David and the prophets. That brings us from the book of Judges all the way to the book of Malachi. This is all of the Old Testament saints. All of them are not looking to this world. They are not looking to comfort. They are not looking for an easy life. They are active. They are diligent. They display radical obedience. Think about Abraham. He left Ur of the Chaldees, left everything he knew, left his family, left his home, left his resources behind. And he went and he lived in a a tent, it says, for the rest of his life, a foreigner on the earth until he died, not receiving the promises in this life. Or you think about Moses, it says in verse 24, Moses forsook fleeting pleasures of this life. He forsook wealth, influence, power, and privileges. He forsook a, a kingly lifestyle in Egypt, all the comforts this world could offer. He said no to those things for the sake of eternal things. And we get now to this section in Hebrews 11. I'm going to break it just in half for you. Just two points tonight. If you want to have an outline, taking notes, it is uh, two points. Two opposite circumstances that showcase the faithfulness of God. Two opposite circumstances. Both showcase God's faithfulness. First, we see miraculous triumphs. The trustworthiness of God is on display in these miraculous acts of faith. God's power on display through the faith of his people. He does miraculous things. You see, they they conquered kingdoms, it says, in verse 33. You think about Gideon. You remember the story of Gideon. He starts out with 22,000 soldiers. And then God says, your army is too big. Reduces it down to 10,000 soldiers to fight hundreds of thousands. 10,000 against hundreds of thousands. And God says, your army is still too big. He says, I will not let an army get my glory. So God reduces his, his army down to 300 men. You remember the story. They have clay jars and they have candles and they defeat a hundred, hundreds of thousands of warriors. That's a great act of faith, a great act of God demonstrated through the faith of Gideon. It says they performed acts of righteousness. You could say they judged. They enacted justice and righteousness. This is what Samuel did. This is what the judges did. They led the nation. They drove out enemies. It says in verse 33, they obtained promises. You think about King David, this great promise that God would would have a son after him on the throne, a forever king in Jerusalem. These acts of faith, they obtained these promises. They believed these promises it says they shut the mouth of lions. Obviously, you think about Daniel in the lion's den. If you were here for Smed's sermon on that, I think that was the, the time that I've seen my kids sit the most still, still during a sermon, when Smed talked about just the, the viciousness of a lion, its teeth, its jaws, just how they could rip apart anything that they touch. You think about Daniel just walked into the lion's den, fearless, because he had faith in a faithful God. Verse 34, it says, they quenched the power of fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a memorable story. We all remember the the fiery furnace. So they said no, they wouldn't bow down to the golden image. 
I just want you to listen real quick to, to their response. Just remind you of Daniel 4, what they say to the king. It says in Daniel 4 that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So you think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They don't know if they're going to be delivered. They say that God will deliver us either from the fire or through the fire. We trust in God, not knowing the outcome. You see a radical faith on display and radical deliverance. God is faithful to them. He goes on to say here that they escaped the edge of the sword. You think about David running from Saul, Elijah running from Jezebel, the prophets that are escaping death. Verse 34, from weakness we're made strong. Think about this just encouraging statement here for all of us with weak, simple faith that God makes weak people strong through faith. The the heroes of the faith here, they did not have resources in themselves. These were not the brightest. These were not the strongest, the the best resourced. These were not not people with human means. The, The reason they could do these great acts is because they had a great God. They trusted in him. The ones who will do great things for God are those that have humble faith, that entrust themselves to God. That is good news for us, good news for us with weakness, that we can trust a a strong God. You think about faith as just like a a conduit, just bringing electricity. I was talking to my six-year-old about, he was asking how electricity works. And he said, as we were talking, he said, Dad, do they really have do they really have power trees? Are power trees real? I was like, power trees, what are you talking about? You know, the place where they make the electricity. I said, oh, power plants, yeah, it's not, it's not a real plant. It's, a, it's like a factory. But uh, it's, it's where the, the electricity is made. You just think about electricity running through conduit, right? It's running through copper wire, right, to the, to the light bulb. And in faith, in that way, God's power brought to us, to weak humans, with no abilities, jars of clay, the Bible would say, but able to do miraculous things through a mighty God. And he continues in 34, verse 34, he says, they became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. You think about King David. King David who killed his 10,000s, they would sing about him. As you read the book of Judges, you see the, the Philistines plague Israel throughout the, the book of Judges, through the reign of Saul, Finally, when David comes on the scene, he finally drives the Philistines out of Israel. He put armies to flight. And you have this crescendo here in verse 35. Start of verse 35, this mountaintop experience. He says, women received back their dead by resurrection. Women received back their dead by resurrection. You have this ultimate victory here. Resurrection from the dead. You have two instances in the Old Testament. One from Elijah, one from Elisha. Both mothers that lost sons. Both sons raised back from the dead, returned to their mothers. These women received back dead sons. You see God's faithfulness on display here. These incredible victories. Even death. Even death would bow the knee to God's power. And if we stopped here, you would think, great. We walked out, we said, great. If I have faith... I can do all these mighty acts for the Lord. I'll have great success. I'll have victories. Even raise the dead. This is great. You might be thinking this is a prosperity message. Name it and claim it. Just have faith and you can do this. But you keep reading in this passage. and It takes a sharp turn in verse 35. It goes from women receiving back their dead by resurrection, this highlight, to now in verse 35, and others were tortured. We see mocking scourging, chains, imprisonment, torture. They were stoned. They were beheaded. They were cut in half. They were without homes, without resources, without any victory in this life. So we find that genuine faith does not put its hope in outcomes, in circumstances, in what we can see. Faith does not work 
just because we get a, a positive outcome. If you look at this with human eyes, what you see is defeat. All of these are defeats. But these, God says, these are victorious acts of faith. That brings us to our second point here, this opposite circumstance, this second circumstance. First was a miraculous triumph, and now an overwhelming tragedy that also showcases God's faithfulness. A faithful God on display through people who take him at his word, even in tragedy. So we realize that outcomes, our, our situations are not the barometer of God's faithfulness. God is the one who determines outcomes. We just have humble faith. When times are hard, we don't need a change in circumstance. That is not our biggest problem. What we need is a, a steadfast confidence in a faithful God. And we need to be reminded of this again as we see the world around us deteriorate. We need to be reminded that faith is not by sight. We walk by faith. We trust in a faithful God, the, the one Jesus who controls all things by his word. That's the one that we trust. So we'll look through these, these overwhelming tragedies and see God's faithfulness highlighted in these great acts of faith. Verse 35, it says, others were tortured, not accepting release. This word tortured literally means to be stretched out. Stretched out, what they would do is their, the picture here is a, a wheel, basically a big wooden wheel and stretching out someone on it. They did this to the Jews in the intertestamental period and they would beat them to death on this wheel. And you see the same thing happen in, in England. If you read uh, English Reformation literature, the, the Catholic Church would bring Protestant reformers to the, what they called the Tower in London and they would put them on what was called the rack and they would tie their feet in their hands, and they would pull them apart until they ripped their hands and their arms out of their sockets. And they would do this so that they would recant, so that they would give up the, the belief, the Protestant beliefs that they had. And that's, what, that's what's going on here. He's saying they were tortured, not accepting release, having an offer. You could deny your faith. You could deny Yahweh and be released, or you could be faithful unto death. And being strong in faith here did not lead to easier circumstances. It did not lead to an easier life. It actually led to torture. It led to imprisonment. It led to death. And how are they able to endure? Look at the end of verse 35. It says, so that they might obtain a better resurrection. They were looking to the future. They were looking to a, a future resurrection a permanent resurrection. We just saw in this passage a temporary resurrection. These women received back their dead sons who would die again someday. But these ones, they were looking to, to a resurrection that wouldn't end, where they would live forever, always in the presence of the Lord. That's what they're looking forward to. That's what they are hoping in. So this was the choice for them, the, an easy path in life or suffering, death, imprisonment, like Paul, Paul says this, Acts 20, verse 24, he says, I do not consider my life of any value to myself, but only that I may finish my course, complete my race. Paul is looking at eternity. He's saying my life does not matter in the scale of eternity, so I'm going to spend it out. I'm going to hold it loosely for the sake of the gospel. That's what's going on here. It's not a prioritizing of life, but a prioritizing of the life to come, of eternal life. They look forward to a better resurrection. Just think about what would keep you during persecution. What would keep you steadfast? It could only be hope in the future resurrection. Hope for relief will not keep you. A change in circumstance may not be possible for you in that moment. We cannot hope in a changing society. We can't hope in governors, presidents, laws. What keeps the, the Christian heart fixed, firm during trials, during temptation, during persecution, is hope in God's future promises, a better resurrection, the, the return of Christ for his people. 
That's where our hope is found. That's how they could withstand this kind of persecution. He goes on to say in verse 36, others experience mockings and scourgings. Yes, also chains and imprisonments. Scourgings, this was to be whipped. Again, more tor torture in view. Chains and imprisonment. They were thrown in prison without food, without the light of the sun, for months, maybe for years. So many of the Old Testament prophets were thrown in prison. I want you to see a couple of these, just to paint a picture for you of, the, of what's going on here when he's talking about just over and over again, God's prophets thrown in prison. If you would turn to 1 Kings 22. 1 Kings 22. Starting in verse 6. 1 Kings 22, 6, and it says, The king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 of men, and said to them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And they said, Go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. So the king of Israel is, is bringing all of these prophets, 400 of them, to say, Should I go to this battle? But now Jehoshaphat, this is the, the king of, of Judah, says, Is there not yet a prophet of Yahweh here that we may inquire of him? The king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of Yahweh, but I hate him, because he does not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. He is Machai, son of Imlah. But Jehoshaphat said, Let the king say so. So the king goes on to, to call Machai. If you flip ahead to verse 25 of chapter 22, verse 25, Machai says to the king, Behold, Machai said, you shall see on the day when you enter an inner room to hide yourself. He's prophesying against the king. And then the king said to, Israel, to the king of Israel, take Machai and return him to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son, and say, thus says the king, put this man in prison and feed him sparingly with bread and water until I return safely. So you see just Machai being faithful, the only faithful prophet out of 400 men, 400 false prophets thrown in prison, mistreated. Turn to, to 2 Chronicles 16. 2 Chronicles 16. Look at verse uh, 7. Similar story, uh, a king is going to battle, asking a prophet to give him a, a good prophecy. 2, 2 Chronicles 16, 7. At that time, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram, and have not relied on Yahweh your God, therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and Lubim an, an, an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on Yahweh, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of Yahweh move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. So he's prophesying against King Asa because of his disobedience. And then Asa, verse 10, responds, he was angry with the seer and put him in prison. And he was enraged at him for this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. So see the reward here again for faithfulness. Faithfully proclaiming God's word imprisonment. Just one more that I want you to see, Jeremiah. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah is repeatedly thrown in prison. He's thrown in prison. He's thrown in a well, mistreated his whole life. Jeremiah 20, verse 1 and 2. It says, when Pashur the priest, the son of Immer, who was chief officer in the house of Yahweh, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pashur had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put him in the stocks that were at the upper Benjamin gate, which was by the house of Yahweh. And turn to Jeremiah 37. Jeremiah 37, verse 11. It says, Now it happened when the army of the Chaldeans had lifted the siege from Jerusalem because of Pharaoh's army, that Jeremiah went out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin in order to take possession of some property there among the people. While he was at the gate of Benjamin, a captain of the guard whose name was Irajah, 
the son of Shelemiah and the son of Hananiah was there. And he arrested Jeremiah the prophet saying, you are going over to the Chaldeans. Jeremiah said, it's a lie. I'm not going over to the Chaldeans. Yet he would not listen to him. So Erijah arrested Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. And the officials were angry at Jeremiah and they beat him. And they put him in jail in the house of Jonathan the scribe, which they had made into the prison. For Jeremiah had come into the dungeon, that is the vaulted cell. And Jeremiah stayed there many days. And you turn over one more page just to see Jeremiah. I just want to paint a picture of just the mistreatment here. God's faithful prophet. Jeremiah, this faithful prophet, repeatedly proclaiming the, the word of the Lord, imprisoned, mistreated. Jeremiah 38, next page over, verse 2. Jeremiah is speaking in verse 2, and he says, Thus says Yahweh, he who stays in this city will die by the sword, and by famine, and by pestilence. But he who goes out to the Chaldeans will live and have his own life as booty and stay alive. Jeremiah is pleading with the people. This is for your good. You will live if you go. He goes on to say, thus says Yahweh, this city will certainly be given into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon and he will capture it. Then the official said to the king, now let this man be put to death. And as much as he is discouraging the men of war who are left in the city and all the people by speaking such words to them, for this man is not seeking the well-being of this people, but rather their harm. So King Zedekiah said, behold, he is in your hand, for the king can do nothing against you. And they took Jeremiah and cast him into the cistern of Malchijah, the king's son, which was in the court of the guardhouse. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. Now in the cistern, there was no water, but only mud. And Jeremiah sank into the mud. So you see Jeremiah thrown into a pit, into a well, into mud for, for trying to save the people. You're going to die. Flee the city. This is the word of the Lord. And he's thrown in a pit. I want you to see just what, what Jeremiah, what his hope is in. If you turn to, to Lamentations chapter 3, he is not hoping in circumstances. His circumstances are, are not getting better. They're getting worse and worse. And as you know the story, the, the city is destroyed. The temple is burned. The people are taken. And Jeremiah is left to watch all of it. Lamentations 3 Verse 19, Lamentations 3, 19, Jeremiah writes, Remember my affliction and my wandering, the wormwood and bitterness. Surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. Here's what it is. Here's what gives Jeremiah hope. Verse 22, Yahweh's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Yahweh is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I have hope in him. Yahweh is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of Yahweh. So you look at the, the life here of Jeremiah. Hopes in God's character. One of these prophets who is mistreated, beaten, imprisoned, all for his faithfulness. You go back to, to Hebrews 11, now in verse 37. He goes on to say that others were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were put to death by the sword. Extra biblical literature would tell us that Isaiah was, was cut in half with a saw. He fled the city was sawn in two, put to death by the sword. We see this, this happen in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, another faithful prophet, head cut off, killed with a sword because of, his, because of his faithfulness. Some were stoned. Go to 2 Chronicles 24. 2 Chronicles 24. In verse 20. Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. And he stood above the people and said to them, Thus God has said, Why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord and do not prosper? 
Because you have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. Verse 21, so they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him to death in the court of the house of the Lord. So you see Zechariah in God's house, stoned to death, buried under a pile of rocks. Think about just rock after rock until he's either numb, unconscious, until he suffocates, until he bleeds to death. Just, just a horrible, vicious way to die, all because he's preaching the word of the Lord. This is the, the fate of God's faithful prophets. This is the fate of, of Uriah, of Jeremiah, slaughtered. A month or, month or two ago, we had in a Sunday school class, we were teaching the story of, of Peter's escape from prison. You remember the story in Acts 12, Peter uh, is in prison, they pray for Peter, a miraculous escape, the Lord sends an angel. Uh, in, in part of the story in the, in the Sunday school lesson, we had a little craft and it said, God answers prayer. God answers prayer, right? Because Peter was released. And, and that is true. God did answer the prayer. But you start in Acts chapter 12, and, you, and you, you start the chapter, and you realize that James was also in prison. James was in prison first. One of the, the apostles who saw the transfiguration, one of the, the inner three apostles. Did, did the people not pray for James, you would ask? Did they pray for James? Did God not answer that prayer? And you know the story, James is beheaded. And as we look at that, we would say, why? Why would the Lord do that? Of course he should rescue Peter. He's going he's gonna to preach. He's going to write the New Testament. But in our minds, we'd say, well, yeah, he should have rescued James. You have a, a small church, 12 apostles. How could you let one of them be killed so quick? You just think about it how dangerous it is for us to get in the business of trying to measure what God is doing, what, what circumstances we think that God should do. Peter does this, right? When, when Jesus says that he's going to, to die, Peter says, no, Lord, don't let it be. And Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. Right? In our human wisdom, we would not see it best that the innocent son of God would, would go to a cross that he would die a death that he didn't deserve. We, we don't see that as best with human eyes, right? The world wouldn't see that as good. But God says, this is the way I'm going to rescue my people, the, the death of my own son. The one who commands the armies of heaven is going to let himself be killed on a cross. The, the worst injustice. And Jesus submits himself to this, submits himself, hopes in God. So we cannot measure uh, circumstances, what God is doing based on circumstances, based on what we think might be best. Our job is to trust a sovereign, good God. Verse 37, he goes on to say, they went about in sheepskins, in goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. These people, these prophets, they had no home. They were poorly clothed. They had no money, no comfort, nothing in this life, no success, no prestige, no savings account, no retirement fund, just loss in this life. But you have this critical phrase in verse 38. He says in verse 38, men of whom the world was not worthy. In your Bible, it might be in parenthesis. It's, it's almost to say this is the, the, co the comment from the, the author here. By the way, let me tell you what's going on behind the scenes. What you can see with your eyes is death, imprisonment, running from, from place to place, living under rocks. These all look like failures, but what God says, God's assessment, verse 38, men of whom the world was not worthy. These men were not lacking. The world was lacking. In, God, in God's measurement, he says, these are heroes. These are my heroes. The world are the ones who are lacking. They are unworthy. These men are worthy. In human sight, we would say failures. Jeremiah was a failure. Nobody listened. 
And God says the world is not worthy of him. God says the world failed. He was faithful. And just think about just how dangerous it is for us to, to prioritize the, the things of the world, the things that we can see, success in the world's eyes. Just, just consider for a minute, what are you prioritizing? What are your goals in life? Who, who would you want to find you worthy? Do you prioritize God's assessment? That he would say of you, the world is not worthy of you because of how you live, because of what you prize. And these men of whom the world was not worthy, they did not live comfortable, safe lives. They lived hard, dangerous, on the run, no home. But they're looking forward, they're looking to a reward. And God puts his stamp of approval on them. He says, the hardship is worth it. I remember this quote from uh, Cassidy Can, one of our missionaries, that the Cans just, just went back to Papua New Guinea. And she says, uh, it's just so impactful when I heard it, she said, every ounce of suffering for the sake of Christ is worth it because Jesus is precious. And that's what's going on here. It is worth it. It is worth it to suffer hardship for the sake of Christ. He ends here in verse 38 by saying, they wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. You think about King David. King David was anointed king by, by Samuel. Anointed king, right after that, he kills Goliath. So you're, you're reading the story and you're thinking, okay, David's going to have a, a pretty good life. He's going to be king. He's going to rule. He's leading armies. And as you keep reading, you see that David is on the run for his life for years living in rocks, living in caves, after he's received the promise, after he's been anointed king. Not an easy life, not an easy path. And we do not know what God is doing behind the scenes in our circumstances. We don't get to, to guess that, to try to measure what's going on with, with circumstances. We just have the opportunity to trust with a, a changing political climate, uh, changing freedoms, maybe health deteriorating, financial stability, maybe falling apart. Our trust must be in an immovable God. And this is the, the fight of faith here. This is the fight of faith to believe what God says. If you believe that God is good, if you believe that God does good, you believe that he is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask? If we submit to those truths, if we cling to those truths, then, then we can withstand upheaval from the world. We can withstand trials. And maybe tonight you are here, maybe you hear these things about a, a hard life, uh, persecution, trials. And maybe you think that, that there is no way that you can even have a category for, for suffering and hardship being good things. You might be here and think, I actually really enjoy my life. I actually really like the things that I have. I actually don't want those things to change. I, I kind of like it here. Well, you must hear tonight, if you love this world and you love the things in this world, you must hear tonight that you will stand before Christ. You will stand before Jesus and you will answer to, to the judge of the living and the dead. And all of those things that you loved in this life, all of those things that you went after in this life, they will not be there for you in that day. They will not comfort you in that day. You must turn to Christ. The, the call of salvation, the call to believe in Jesus is a call to die to this world. To, to follow Jesus, to lose the, the good things maybe in this life. You might lose friendships. You might lose comfort. You might lose even future dreams. But you will gain Christ. And that is far better. Would you pray with me? 
God, we just thank you so much for your word. I just thank you for the men and women, children here. Pray that you would impress these truths on our hearts. I pray that we would be a, a people who hold fast to the truth uh, tonight that we heard, the truth in Hebrews 11. Lord, that we would walk by faith and not by sight, that we would have confidence in your character, in your goodness, that we would have confidence in your word, in your promises, Lord, that we would look to eternity and we would see those things more clearly than we see with our eyes, Lord. We love you. Thank you, Jesus, for salvation, for bringing us into a church family, for giving us your word, giving us the eternal life. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.